Hello and welcome to episode 14 of Mjolnir the Movies. Uh, I'm David Yorkshire and I'm here as usual with Neil Westwood and James. Hello to you two. Hello. 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 Now, uh, this time as uh, M. Night Shyamalan... Um, Ding dong. That, uh, that director's uh, trilogy comes has come to a close uh, with the last episode uh, which, which was Glass. Uh, so starting with Unbreakable... Uh, moving on to Split, uh, just a couple of years ago, and now we we have the last uh, instalment, which is Glass. Although they're not really a trilogy as such, but we'll get on to that. Um, but first, I think I'd like to look a little bit about M Night Shyamalan um, as a director, because he started out uh, really set off like a train, didn't he? What happened to him? I think he just got too comfortable in this amazing twist reveal and he kind of got lost in his own ego, I think, and every single one of his movies ends with some ridiculous plot twist and it's just not exciting anymore. People aren't that dumb anymore. People will not believe that an alien can come from the other side of the galaxy only to be killed by a glass of water. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that was a bit crappy, wasn't it, on that signs? It really yeah, was. Yeah, it was awful. It was a lot better with War of the Worlds, this a surprise, you know, kill for the aliens. And it was all more believable, which is sad considering how old that story is by comparison. I know it's believable as well. Aliens come all this way and they get a basic cold or flu bug and that's what kills them, but yeah. water? I mean, did they not think that when they were heading to Earth that this The giant ball comes in water. water? Yeah. <laughs> And, and, and Might be a bit dangerous there, lads. The thing is that it, it was actually a rip-off, if you remember that film, Alien Nation, with James Kahn. True. Oh, yeah, yeah. that's right. Forgot yeah. about that. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was everyone has. Yeah, everyone's forgotten about that. Yeah, that, there was a TV series of that and everything, no? That's right, yeah. Um, al although they replaced James Kahn because they couldn't afford him. No. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Um, but uh, yeah, um, so I mean, the Sixth Sense was was a really great film, and then he did Stuart Little um, after that, and then uh, then he did Unbreakable, which is the first part of the films that we'll be looking at. Uh, and I th personally think that Unbreakable is his best film to date, and I think that it's um, it's very underrated. Actually, it didn't really. Uh, it didn't really make that much of a mark at the box office, not, not as much as it should have done, not as much as The Sixth Sense at any rate. Um, but, but then he soon went downhill in trying to cobble together surprise endings, and I think that he pigeonholed himself into this surprise ending director, except that they became sort of retarded endings, as, as you've pointed out. And he um, he forgot what the art of filmmaking is all about. It's about getting from A to B and the journey in between. And that might sound like a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's uh, it's also an eternal truth. The, the, what, what, you, what you need is, is a good beginning. You want to know where you're going to get to at the end. And then you, you know, you, you create drama and tension along the way to get there. And that keeps the film audience engrossed. And you don't need a surprise ending at all. No. Yeah. I think it works in films like The Sixth Sense. But the thing is with that, you can only watch that film once. Yeah, that's... Because, because you know that Bruce Willis is a ghost again. I, I Just spoil that for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Um, everyone, Bruce Willis is actually dead all along. Sorry. Invaders, Luke's father... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Kaiser Soze is verbal. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, the, um, the, there is that. I, I think that you can watch that film twice actually, because you watch it sort of once and you're surprised, and then you want to go back and look for the clues. So, mm. so there is, there is that. But after that, it sort of loses its value, really. I think what happened with yeah. him though is. It's it's the danger of get shifting from either no uh, renown or success to a big success, you know, a real hit. 
you obviously get a temptation to try and recreate that moment again. And it takes us a lot harder to get another hit through something completely original. You know, you're always going to be tempted to try and revisit that same route. You know, it just seems so easy. Oh, I'll just rehash it. And you probably will, with something like the, the film, get a, you know another one in and people will not really notice. But after you've done it a few <laughs> times, people get bored of it. And of course, with a success, everyone else will also try and copy it for the same reason. So you're kind of, you end up in a downward spiral if you can't keep that originality going. It's kind of like, a, well, his films are like spooky versions of Columbo because you know you're getting set up with something and you're trying to figure it out before it gets to the end so you can be better than Columbo. And that's what I feel like when I watch his movies. I just know that I'm going to be made fun of and at the end it's all going to be a dream. Somebody's going to be dead all along. It's all going to be a big setup or a, like some kind of conspiracy. I just feel like I'm not watching it, really. I, why am I watching this when I know that everything I'm watching is going to be like changed right in the last 30 seconds of the movie? Yeah, if it's going to do that, you can't even know about it. If you go to think, oh, that director's going to do that to me every time, then it's ruined already. Yeah, yeah. And believe it or not, in this new one, Glass, I won't reveal it. But there is a twist at the end, believe it or not. No, I think I think we're going to have to review yeah. it actually. And besides, the film's uh, been and gone at the cinema, so so um, spoiler warning, no complaints. That's right, yeah. So uh, we're going to reveal the, the spoilers. So uh, you know, um, click off now if you bother. After about you it. leave a thumbs up. After you leave a th <laughs> yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. And subscribe. <laughs> subscribe really to the channel. Nasty comment. That's right. Don't leave nasty comments about MGTOW and shit. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not Irish. Uh, no, not about no. Sorry, sorry, I got that wrong. You can leave nasty comments about MGTOW and shit, but not about us. We don't want nasty right, comments got... from MGTOW. And now we've got that out of the way. Yeah, let's ruin the movie for you. Yeah, and uh, no, I'll, I'll tell you what. We'll we'll stop it there and have a surprise ending. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. that, um, that's a twist, folks. See you later. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Um, yeah, um, Unbreakable. Uh, I, I think that Unbreakable is a film with a justifiable twist. Yeah. I think that that's, you know, he, he really worked that well. And it wasn't, it didn't feel cheap, and it wasn't just, ta-da, you know, and he lifts the cloth off, and there it was. You know, it, it, it actually felt almost like it wasn't a twist in a way, because, you know, it headed towards that point you know in a straight line you know rather than a twist to me anyway i didn't guess at it but you know it felt right that's right yeah yeah it did uh, not like fucking aliens with a glass of water <laughs> yeah no, no that, that's right it's one of those twists where you go oh of course um but i don't you, you know, know. see it coming sorry what? i kind of did if I, I kind of did if i'm honest with you because oh, i knew sorry, I, yeah. well, well i, I kind of guess by the fact it's called Glass, then I knew it was going to be about him. I knew it was going to be his closure some way. I just, I, I just had this feeling that this was going to be a thing where everything was going to be set up by Glass, like everything, and there was going yeah, to be. A you wouldn't have known that. You wouldn't have known that in the first one. Oh, not in the first one, no. But in yeah. this new one, this new one, absolutely. I knew it was all going to be a hmm. sort of penguin esque reveal because if you, if you watch um, like the Batman comics or whatever. Penguin always makes it look like he's getting defeated or his reign is coming to an end and right at the very end he reveals that he's been planning everything. And Glass is kind of the same. It's like the black penguin. Yeah, I mean Glass, yeah, that, that's right. Um, it is. But, um, but I mean, we were talking about Unbreakable. What, what do you think about Unbreakable, the ending for that, Neil? Yeah, it, it was okay. I mean, it, it's. I preferred the, the, the story itself, how the the son was looking up to Bruce Willis's character as like a hero or like, a, like a, an idol. I preferred that part of it. I, I just don't really like twist endings, if I'm honest with you. They don't really do it for me. Mm. I, I, I I tend to agree with James that I didn't see that it was a, that much of a twist ending. And all, all it was, really, that you were too focused on the relationship and the, the drama aspect and, and his um, evolution. Uh, into superheroism, you were too focused on that to realize what the twist was going to be, 
or that there was even going to be a twist. Because normally, yeah. in every superhero film, the twist, uh, well, the, the, uh, sorry, the climax is really the uh, superhero battling the villain at the end. And we had that with that guy mm. who had, had that family chained up. Um, and so you thought that that was it. And, and, and that the the denouement is, had, had reached its uh, you, you know had reached its resolution and you were you were finished and that that was it that soup the, the the ending was that he'd come into his uh, his vocation in life uh, who he was meant to be but then there was the the extra twist where the mentor is the real villain and and that but, but i think that it was justified if if you look at it uh, cuz it goes into there's a lot of discourse with comic books during the film and often the the supervillain starts off as a friend or as an associate of of the superhero yeah that's true true so it, it, you know it it was logical I think what what made, makes it easy to miss is that you focus so much on the hero naturally, rather than the non-physical villain, you know, mm -hmm. because his his uh, ability is mental. He naturally enough, you know, fades into the background compared to a guy who seems invincible and very strong. Yeah, yeah. and obviously has all the charisma. And the other guy's like got this brittle bones disease and he can't really use his body or his physical abilities. He has mm. to rely on his cunning. So, in the back of your head, you've already written him off because he seems so fragile, he's not a threat. You know, yeah. he doesn't seem important. So you, you've mentally already put him to the back of your head. But that's that's a trick and it's quite a fair trick, really. Yeah, you know, it, it doesn't feel cheap. It's, it's not just, just that. It, it goes beyond that. You actually feel sympathy for him. You feel sorry for the guy. Mm. And, yeah. but that, and that's good because in real life you can have a sad past to a villain you know but it doesn't mean he, he's now he's you know he's now okay you just leave him to do his villainous things that, that's right but but that, what i'm saying is that because you've felt sympathy for him for a whole the whole film it's blindsided you to to the surprise ending that he's the villain yeah and also it, it's quite clever because you you feel sorry for him and if you feel sorry for a bad character then you know your mind's conflicted. So when he's carrying out his evil acts or doing his evil deeds, it's not so much that you're against him, but you can kind of sympathize with him and it, it plays with your emotions in a way. Like your morality kind of takes second place for an hour and a half. Especially as the people involved, I, um, I don't know if you kind of thought about it much, but you notice how normal and wholesome the families were really showing us, okay, they had their problems, but you could see that the couple are struggling and they try and patch things up. Uh, Mr. Glass family, you know, you see, all oh, right, they're trying to get along. It's a nice, normal family otherwise. And, you know, everybody's normal people. You don't have this, uh, as you tend to expect now in films, a lot of the kind of freaks yeah. uh, or the push button excuses for things like oh mr glass is that way because somebody was racist to him or bullied him because of that you know it's it they could have gone a lot of bad routes that you might expect in modern film but they didn't i, I think you know, that, yeah i think that that's what i like about Sher elements films actually because he's not political really he, he even at this sorry go on no <laughs> go on sorry okay see so even at the start in the 60s, they show the the black woman having the baby in the upmarket shop with the doctor coming in and there's nothing but respect and decent treatment between each other. But again, he could have portrayed that any way he liked with any excuse if he wanted to push those buttons. Yeah, absolutely. He certainly avoids all that. This is something that, that I like about M. Night Shyamalan in that he doesn't get involved in all that kind of SJW politics and so on and or, or anti-white racism. Um, what one might, you know, I mean, one might sort of laugh a, a little bit about the um, hyper intelligent character being black or, or whatever, but I, I don't really notice it myself. And, and there are very intelligent black people, so yeah, but it's not like he, he was rubbing our, our faces and he's like the blackest man you can find, and you know, making him super intelligent, like in 
Star Trek and all that nonsense movies that are come out where there's a, an obligatory black guy and he just knows everything and he's super clever and super intelligent. They never really pushed it with with this one. It wasn't in your face. And he it wasn't like he, he it wasn't like his uh, sort of typical Samuel L. Jackson character with his um, famous word. He wasn't like the gangster black guy anymore. He was just like a really clever, sinister bad guy. Yeah, it was actually very convincing yeah. in the role, I thought. I mean, that's what I was thinking as well. He didn't play to black stereotypes. He just sounded as intelligent and articulate as he could. And it, it sounded, you know, realistic. Yeah, that, that's right. Yeah. As a lot of them, the, the other films or TV, they'll have this ridiculous character sound like the, you know, speaking baby language from the ghetto, but yet somehow able to work out stuff on the fly and do everything, like, you know, the kind of Mary Sue or whatever. Yeah, like the, the black um, scientist in the Avengers movie, and she mm. says something to the effect of there's like 200 trillion um, data codes that I have to figure out. Give me a couple of minutes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, okay, <laughs> really? Ah, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's right. It's, um, and, and, and she was very anti-white as well, as I remember. And the other thing yeah. with his intelligence is it was also realistic because it was focused it wasn't an expert in everything by any means he was but he was obsessively focused because of his lifestyle which is also another realistic excuse and reason to be such an expert he'd focus completely on comics myths and everything around that and you think yeah somebody that spent 40 years obsessing about comics and you know and myths and so on would be able to just tell you all this stuff about it yeah, you, you absolutely get those kind of people at comic cons and so on. So it, it was very believable. And someone who is so physically frail, I suppose, would be obsessed with that. Um, it's almost like Nietzsche, if you look at his life and, and what he philosophized. He's, you know, physically he was extremely weak and frail. Is always going on about strength and power and so on, and and you sort of get that, um, and 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 that's his obsession. is is almost a kind of a Nietzschean figure in a way. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I've not, never read Nietzsche. Sorry. All oh, right. Well, anyway, <laughs> so, the same with D. H. Lawrence as well. I don't know if you read him. No, no, no. Oh, I've read okay. a bunch of Stephen King books and uh, Lord of the Rings, oh, but I don't really... Ah, oh, well, Stephen King, yes, yeah, Stephen King. Um, he builds up people he doesn't like and then and then sort of kills them horrifically in his book yeah. because he was, he, was weak, he was weak and picked on at school. <laughs> <laughs> it's, but it's true, <laughs> you know. I've yeah. always... I've always been a bit suspicious of the Twilight Zone and stuff where you've, you know, you'll get some story about somebody that spits at a bus stop or something and something horrible happens to him. I think, I bet you that writer's just been annoyed about that that week and he's thought, I'll get the bugger. <laughs> yep. Well, there was a, there was a comic up. Um, uh, you, you, you guys um, will know uh, DC Thompson, of course, because that was a Scottish uh, publication. Oh. And uh, published all kinds of British comics. And... They had one called Shark, where the uh, the, the person of uh, you know who uh, the editor hated that particular week would would get savaged by a shark. <laughs> 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 what a job! <laughs> so that's uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's uh, they they had a great sense of humour at DC Thompson actually. It was a, um, are all those old days of nice wholesome fun. <laughs> yeah, they, they were incredibly politically incorrect. Uh, but anyway, um, I suppose we should we should get back to uh, the films. Um, Did what, you like the use of camera angles in this first one as well? I yes. thought there was a lot of clever camera work, which I don't think was present in the latter two as much. But it was definitely felt original. You know, you see the tricks like the voyeuristic shot in the train and the use of the camera upside down a couple of times to throw you off. Well, do, do you know what that goes back? That goes back to comics again. What he was trying to do was to create the atmosphere of comics in film. 
and That's so right, yeah. You, yeah so you get these sort of shots from odd angles and so on um that you do in comics uh, like you know look look in 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 the comics they, they'll always have sort of very strange angles on things and so on that emphasize um height or you, you know they exaggerate uh angles and so on and i think that that w that's very much where he was up to yeah it kind of felt like a comic book movie really it felt more like a comic book movie than what the avengers or something would feel like it, you, yeah. you felt like you were reading a comic book true it was more faithful in the sort of feel and the spirit of it yeah just it just flowed really nicely just it, it was good it, artistically it was a good good looking movie um, absolutely um i i appreciate really what he um he did with that he, he also I, I mean the the village is extremely fa flawed the later film that he did but at least he tried to sort of recreate fairy tale on film and and so he, he he does that he you know he looks at the genre and tries to recreate it in film uh or at least he did but he seems to have got lazy now to be quite honest and he's no longer looking at the craftsmanship of filmmaking anymore it's i don't know if it's laziness or or, or uh if he's just lost his touch or, or whatever maybe uh, interference from the studio or somebody could could be um you know if he's under pressure to get the thing out um that could also be the case but back when he was doing unbreakable he was really on the ball with all this stuff um i, I love the the long language shots of um you know of, of, of bruce willis uh, when you know when he's conflicted or in thought uh, and so on he's he's not scared to sort of leave the camera there so that you sort of you're pensive with him and so on yeah yeah you yeah, let the actors act yeah yeah cause there's I, too many movies now that are too jumpy they cut so quickly you get confused it never really gives an actor a chance to fully express himself if you're seeing him from every single angle shaky cameras and all that at least with like this movie you kind of seen bruce willis or, or samuel L. jackson talking and doing what they do best which is acting it, you didn't get all this cutty flashing um sort of stuff that goes on in modern movies and i, I like that yeah and, and i think that the acting is exceptional i think this is bruce willis's best film to be quite honest um he, it, it shows actually that he, he can really act if given the chance uh i i knew yeah, that yeah. from from back when he was um he did that film with goldie horn i've, I've forgotten what it's called now though yeah, um, it's the one where goldie horn and and that other woman they um they become immortal and so on and they're trying to um, death becomes her that's it death becomes her yeah that's the one and um and in that he plays a completely different kind of role to it's what unrecognizable he he, absolutely yeah and i think and the first time i saw it, i didn't even realize it was him at first <laughs> i i know uh, yeah that, that's that's when i th when i thought actually this guy can act and <laughs> and, and and this uh film to me reinforced that uh the sixth sense as, as well um but this is the one where, where he's really on top of his game and he um he puts a lot into it and you can see that he actually cares about the role oh yeah but uh, he's not like a great actor let's be honest i mean He's this kind of hush voice, quiet, um, cool, super, uh, sorry, not superhero, cool, tough guy for most of his movies. But I, th but I think you're right. I think this is his best role, but he hasn't really got a whole hell of a lot of movies that I would really say, oh, I really want to go and see that again. It's a Bruce Willis movie. Um, but this film is, is good because he actually acts. He doesn't just sit there and like, um, like or run away from explosions and crawl through tunnels with his shoes off he actually acts and you, you can actually believe he's a, a real character what really i think pushes that home is how in the kind of quiet scenes you know where he's just you can see he's thinking about cheating in his marriage or life at home's getting him he looks like he fits everything about that you know it looks very realistic but at the same time he was also able to look really uh realistic when he was going into the home really nervous and worried and upset at what he sees everything about that 
felt very realistic. It didn't feel over the top or hammed up or like you had to be kind of given breadcrumbs through the way this, the story was played out to tell you, oh, he, he's acting this way or he's thinking this way. You could just tell from his face with no dialogue what was going on. Yeah, and I'll, yep. t- I'll tell you what, that contrasts with the last film uh, to me, uh, Glass, where it really grated and irritated me that Samuel L. Jackson was being used as a narrator almost all the time uh, to tell That's you what was That's a big reversal. Yeah, exactly. And this this shows to me that Shia has lost the art of storytelling somewhere along the way. And also, mm. he must have stopped trusting his actors because his actors obviously had it in them if they did it in the first film. Why yeah. not just let them convey the emotion that he's needing to be given? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Do you think it was deliberate, the in the next two films, um, Split and Glass, do you think he wrote them deliberately to be sequels, especially Split? Do you think he had any intention of, of considering that a sequel, or was that like an afterthought? It does feel oh, like I can make another film out of this. It, it just feels that the, the Split and Glass were really contrived, and it was all planned out so they could make a whole bunch of spin-offs and sequels yeah uh, apparently um he he was going to have that character uh in unbreakable the the one played by james mcavoy can't remember his name now um but the one in split anyway and james had some like james twen- isn't it? dennis james hit a book yeah that's right he's got very 20 names, names. Uh, yeah that's right so i can't think of what to call him we'll call him ah uh, the horde isn't it um the they call it yeah, ah, yeah. all together. Yeah, that's right. And uh, yeah, he, um, apparently he was going to feature in the first film, but he didn't know, really know where to put him. So he th- he thought, well, I'll put him on the back burner and have a film all to himself. You couldn't have him explained in that film with all. Ever- I mean, that first film there wouldn't be room to fit him in with everything else and explain what the heck's going on with him. But too much. That's right. Yeah, it's um, you, you, you're right. It, it, it's um, there's no place for him really. Uh, it, it really is sort of the family, uh, Bruce Willis, and and the uh, and, and the supervillain kind of thing. So you have you have sort of two two threads going on really, uh, the family life and the superhero life. Which is actually exactly what every superhero has almost. He has these two sort of pers- personalities or two parts of himself that he has to keep separate. And, yeah. and, and that is al- also a source of tension. And, you know, how does he keep them separate? And, uh, you know, how does he integrate them? What, to what extent does he do that? Um, how does he protect his family? How does he stop people from knowing who he is? And, uh, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's always part of the narrative. What's different is the way it's approached in this. It's actually too far ahead of its time in a way, this film, because about if it had been made about ten years later, after all the superhero films had got going, you know, all the Marvel and DC stuff that's come out since, then I think people would have got it a bit more. Yeah, yeah. I mean, people. Neil, oh. Sorry, no, carry on, carry on. I, I was just going to say, as Neil was saying there, uh, that all these modern sort of uh, hero films that are coming out, that they, they actually are regressing. You know, the, the storytelling they're, they're far behind. All the things you were mentioning about the how the conflict of real life and hero life. A lot of these films don't even cover that. They're just magical people that pop out of nowhere and do magical things and then for 90 yep. minutes and they're away again. Yeah, that's right. And uh, there's a little mention of this in, in the, the last film, which you get from the first film for me. And I don't want to sound like I, I, want to, I want to be vigilante here, but you can kind of hope that if you... Or like Bruce Willis's character in that film, remember the the janitor, the, the rapist janitor. You would think that somewhere inside you, you could muster up the courage to go out and get that guy if he found out what he was doing. 
it's not like the out the realms of possibility to see yourself doing something like that. Saving the world from aliens, on the other hand, nobody can resonate with that. So this is kind of like the superhero movie for your everyday average Joe who deep down wants to be a vigilante. Yeah, that, that was the cleverest thing about it. The violence, the situations, and even the feats he achieves are all just on the edge of what you might see in a normal life. Yeah. You know, was, everything was just right at the edge of a normal life. You know, he was very strong for his size, he was tough for his size, and he had these unusual situations or had to do something heroic. But it was all believable. You know, you could imagine somebody, an, yeah. a security guy coming across some scene like that and doing something. That's that's right. Yeah. It, and uh, so you feel more emotionally attached to it than you do about some magical elf throwing fireballs. <laughs> <laughs> magical elf. Yeah, the, um, that's uh, also a big difference for me between Unbreakable and Glass. Because in Unbreakable, as you say, the violence is very realistic. Uh, and, and it's very sort of matter of fact. It's not stylized or anything. In um, in glass, that really sort of becomes Marvel DC esque. Yeah, be becomes especially disappointing. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, especially right at the end with the big Barney between them, and you see the the Beast character running across. I I'm sure I saw that same scene in one of the Avengers or something, or the X Men, with that loping across the ground wall for limbs yeah. I'm sure I've seen that before with one of the X-Men or something and that's oh, Wolverine yeah something like that and that's where it starts you, know, you think oh wait a minute are these people going to start hovering in laser eye vision or something yeah it was, it was a bit naff wasn't it it was just a bit naff it felt like a superhero movie that had run out of money like the old 1970s Spider-Man and then, and then you know as well what makes it worse is they have the budget, but that means they're using these special effects just to kind of fill it out or something, or make it seem more spectacular. When the first one, actually there's very little effects, special or otherwise. You know, most of it's actually in completely normal situations. Even the big fight in the first one, it just amounts to him strangling the guy from behind. Yeah. You know, a chokehold, yeah. it doesn't even, you know, it's not even like they're doing amazing punches. He gets pushed out a window and then chokes the guy when he sneaks up totally realistic yeah. you know and this one's like totally wwe wrestling at yeah points. i mean this car's getting knocked over <laughs> him smashing yeah. in the tanks and stuff yeah that, that's right he, he completely lost the whole point of what he was doing actually uh shalom he um yeah and and to to be honest it's, it's very odd because i mean the film split was only a couple of years before but I got a, a huge sense of realism with that as well. Um, yeah. That to me was very much in the same vein as um, as Unbreakable, even though it was completely different and you got sort of a little segue into it at the end there with the, mm -hmm. you know, where, where Bruce Willis is looking up the, uh, at the screen in the cafe about uh, this, uh, this guy who's, uh, who's attacked these, uh, these women, uh, or these young girls, sorry. And um, you know, and she said, "Oh, yeah, it's just like that other guy. Um, you know that. Um, what, what did? What was he called?" And you know, he said, "Mr. Glass." Yeah, you know, and so you got it at the end, and it, it, that didn't feel cobbled in too much, actually. It, it didn't no. feel, you know, it, it again, you know, it was a bit of a mm. surprise ending, but it didn't feel too cobbled in. And that's that film split actually actually made me think, ah, he's got his touch back again. Hmm. As uh, M Night Shyamalan, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and and the, the thing, you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. But the thing about the, the last one is, you know that they're superheroes. He's pretty much told you. But the other two films, you're still in the position: is he or isn't he? You know, in the third movie, there's there's absolutely no question about it. They are superheroes. They have got superpowers. Um, Bruce Willis is unbreakable. The Beast is actually a beast. And Glass is a super intelligent super villain, mm -hmm. um, but the other films like you're you're still not sure is this the, like a split personality disorder or is he actually turning into a beast? Is Bruce Willis a superhero or isn't he? That's the whole point of the films. But this one is just like they are, and that's yeah, it. The third one where they could have gone with 
and they, I think they chose the worst pass down the middle, is they could have either gone completely one way, where the psychologist was legit and correct, where they aren't heroes, and it was just freak, you know, luck, freak circumstances, there's always an explanation, and they're just that one in a million, all these things lined up. It, you know, yeah. if they'd went that way and just played it straight, it would actually have been really interesting. Or if they decided to go the other way and they are superheroes, they could have made that part much shorter and that could have been the introduction and then, oh, stuff happens. But instead that whole just mm. dragged on and on and on to 90% of the film and then, oh, there's superheroes at the end and stuff happens and there it is, over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and nothing really happened. It felt like nothing happened. Yeah, and, and then you got this bit cobbled in about this secret organisation. Oh, and what it's awful. What was that all about? Halloween. 10,000 years they've apparently been at this. Fuck off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was my reaction as it happened. <laughs> You're right. I, I felt cheated by the last film, I'll be honest, because, yeah, as I say, we, after Split, I thought, M. Night Shyamalan... He's he's got his uh, he's got his touch back and and then I watched Glass and I thought oh no he hasn't. I mean the, the second the split was that really engaging feeling you get watching any of these sort of uh, you know psycho type I don't mean the film itself but I mean you know like the Silence of the Lamb types you know all these things where you've got this deranged person you know he's deranged and you're just waiting to see how this plays out this ticking time bomb and you felt the tension watching it. And the girls, even what I really appreciated with it was the girls were realistic as well. Even the intelligent one who was the, the calmest and even explained, you know, why. And all the things they attempt are realistic ways to, you know, work out and get out of the situation. There's no uh, her ninja kicking them, sudden super strength from one of them, you know, something real, ridiculous. You know, they, they suddenly become expert fighters. They even uh, ex show explicitly they aren't going to be able to do that that's right um it was incredible again incredibly realistic uh which harkened back to unbreakable and so you 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 felt a sense of fear for those young girls especially given the uh, as well the claustrophobic atmosphere added to it and then you got a sort of a release when james mcavoy's character went to the psychiatrist and so on and and you wondered, you know, well, you know, can he can he sort of uh, come back to being normal again or not? And you know, it, it really sort of it, it was a well worked film, um, especially the claustrophobic elements. Uh, I, I think in the sense of danger. Um, it's another case where probably the, <laughs> I don't know if a budget had anything to do it, but you feel it. Like a restriction in the budget where you couldn't just have X-Men and Avengers still infinite money sets, infinite CGI definitely helped because what you had was small plasterboard rooms, small wooden rooms a, a single office for the uh, psychiatrist and th that was it really for most of it very small, very cheap but it worked ten times better than the CGI festivals yeah, yeah absolutely and just simple things like when he bent the bars and stuff like that, you know, that's, that costs nothing. Yeah. It was just and it was effective, but at that point it's built up and you do feel terrified watching him do this because you don't know where it's going to go. It all, you, know, you feel there's a real danger to the characters. Yeah, that, that's right. And I, I love the way it built up to the beast where, I mean, it was down to obviously to the actor. He did put in a tremendous performance. Where that build up to him, and that was his humanity gone. You know, he lived up to the name, the beast. That was everything was stripped. It was rage and hunger. You know, <laughs> and you felt this was more terrifying than even. I, th I thought he was more scary than the aliens out, you know, out of the, the franchise by that point. Yeah, you're almost like a little bit scared of the the time coming in the movie where he's going to reveal himself. It's kind of creepy. The the tension. Mm. Opposed to like the actual reveal, the tension was like scarier, I think. But uh, and when it was revealed, it's not preposterous. I was expecting this really typical kind of bad guy, but he's kind of terrifying. I've got to hand it to him, he scary guy. Yeah, 
And and the way that the clever thing was well were they had the the two lesser evil characters who were obviously very scary because you're seeing a lot of this through the point of view of the two girls and the psychiatrist. So you've got a kind of old woman and you've got two very young girls, neither of which are going to be able to defend themselves against this physically fit man. So you actually mm-hmm. feel scared for all these people just from this uh, mentally ill man to start with. The Dennis character yeah. that comes through that's obviously a sort of pervert and quite dangerous. And you've got the Patricia, the cross-dressing one, who puts on an even more bizarre angle. And then... Yep. You th- you know, you've already kind of built up to the point where you're worried about the danger from them, and then the beast comes out where even those remnants are stripped away. Yeah, that's And did right. you notice in a new one, there's a little, sorry, there's a little line in there, and I, I kind of laughed because I'm not sure if it was deliberate, but when Patricia's character is revealed, the, the guy says to her, ma'am, and he, she shakes her head and kind of like lifts her hand and like says, no, Patricia will do. And I'm, is that like a little joke about the, uh, you know, calling a, a guy a, a girl when he's not in Patricia saying, you know, no, just call me Patricia. Don't call me ma'am. Hmm. It was like a little joke in there. Oh, so, sort of a tranny joke. Yeah, yeah, like that video that's been around about the, the tranny in the, the game <laughs> store. It's ma'am. It yeah. was, do you think it was a nod at that's things like that? I don't know. It may be because that's on our minds now. Is that uh, yeah, true? That one, although the, that, the first uh, one, man, I should say, in the game store. The first one couldn't have happened if uh, M Night thing my job <laughs> uh, was bound to the political pressures of today. You couldn't have that that reveal, very dramatic reveal, where you see what looks like him talking to somebody else, and it turns out he was in cross dressing which is set up entirely to, sh- to be a moment of showing the depths of his madness. It's a re- actually a really scary moment. It's not funny or silly. It's a very scary moment when you see that this person is completely deranged and part of it is the cross-dressing, quite explicitly. Yeah, well, which uh, fr- in a way, it's a reference to Psycho, of course. I mean, could, could the film Psycho mm. have been made today? Not mm. the way it was, probably. Did you notice know, about the Sorry, I just want to go back. Did I accidentally say the woman in the game store? Or did I say the man in the game store? Because I think I've been brainwashed with all this nonsense. <laughs> it does. I think you're just terrified <laughs> that mountain was going to punch you. Yeah. <laughs> but, all seven foot of muscle. <laughs> but, so uh, everybody no, knows what I meant. But see the, the cross dressing Patricia character, how uh, James McAvoy's character obviously dresses up in women's clothes, but. He doesn't wear a wig. <laughs> he doesn't do the full shebang. He doesn't wear a wig. Mm, that's true. So yeah. he's like got this character and he's got the clothes, but he doesn't even get a wig. And it's kind of creepy because you're seeing this guy and he, he's dressed like a woman. He acts like a woman. Kind of sounds like one. But it just adds this sinister kind of level. You know, but you never thought to get yourself a long blonde haired wig or something like that. Like even wear a hat. But I suppose that's helped me show the, the depths of the madness. You know, to the viewer, it's giving you the signal that <laughs> this person really thinks he's whatever. Like when he's the kid, yeah. you know, he doesn't notice the fact he's still taller than the girls, even though he thinks he's nine years old. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's a really good um, character he's played. Um, mm. I'm, I'm wondering if things like that were his decision or if they deliberately said, no, don't wear a wig. Because they could have gone full tranny. You know, that's and like nice. like lipstick and like big massive gold earrings and long fingernails and fake tits and stuff like that. But he never done anything like that. No, they wanted to show that the cross dressing was a sign of madness. They didn't want to any sympathy for him at all. Mm. Yeah, which is uh, very interesting. We 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 think that um, now the politically correct climate would be to have someone like that as a sympathetic character. Yeah, mm. they'd be making you feel sorry for them. Yeah, and you wouldn't be allowed to dead name them, so you've got to keep track of all those names. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Twenty three of them that you might come up with, but mm. that's just the thing. These days, that is now apparently legit. Somebody has the right to demand you keep up with something like that, because there are people now who can <laughs> claim to be whatever at the drop of a hat. Well, yeah, yeah they can just make up when they wake up. Yeah, and, uh, and literally there's cases that talk where people, you know, can turn up to various 
<laughs> government jobs with different IDs, depending what what they feel like that day. I know. And yet, this film reveals that in a very unsympathetic light, and makes it all the more ridiculous. Because say, well, if you can be one and or two, why not twenty three, twenty four? It's um, yeah, it's 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 a film that really looks at uh, psychology from a politically incorrect angle when you think about it because I mean not just a tranny thing but they always say that oh you know these kind of people they're more likely to harm themselves than other people and you know and all this kind of politically correct spiel this this film goes no 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 they're complete nut jobs <laughs> you know and, uh, <laughs> and they're, they're dangerous yeah an interesting thing about um McAvoy's character is that we're told or we're given the impression that he's just a normal kid and he had a traumatic life and became the way he is because of the trauma of his father dying. But th that makes me wonder though, but he still killed people. He still like murdered people. So I don't feel bad that he's getting killed at the end. I don't really have much sympathy for him compared to the sympathy I have for Glass. Um, I, I just think it, it's one of these things where if you look at in society now, are these like rapists, pedophiles, sex offenders? And they always say the same old thing. Uh, you know, they're, they're mentally deranged. It was a result of abuse, why they did it. They feel bad, feel sorry for us. Um, at the end of the day, they're, they're still child rapists, child murderers. And James McAvoy's character is still at the end of the movies. He's still a murderer. Yeah, the, 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 there's a bit more to it than that, isn't there? He gets abused by his mother after his father dies. Yeah. But that's but, what makes part of his character so good. You know, they can give you yeah. a reason for it. There's always a reason for something. But it's not an excuse. At no point yeah, in the film exactly. he even hinted that you should have sympathy for this person over the girls or the danger the psychiatrist might be in. You know, it's just played straight. You know, he might have had this background, but now he's dangerous, so that doesn't matter. You know the reason for it, but he's still a danger to the public and needs yeah. to be stopped. And that's great because that's more how we would think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Although I think that in Glass that undoes it a little bit, to be honest. I think that's going to be a case where we have to. Yeah. This is going to have to be one of these uh, trilogies where we say there's only two films. I think. <laughs> yeah. 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 Glass really. Um, I don't know what the hell Sharon was thinking with Glass. I really don't. Because it undo it undoes a lot of the good work that he did in the prior two films. And you, you get that sort of young girl coming back and has this sort of Stockholm syndrome with him. That's because but, she... Yeah, she goes a, <laughs> that a big hug at the end. Yeah, because I, I saw that coming at the end of the second one, though, Split, where you, I knew fine well what was going to happen with that. Although they didn't show it in that film, was from that experience she was going to have strength to deal with the, the rapey uncle, which is why she has sympathy for uh, the Horde. But then they took that and obviously went very far with it in the third one but I th who didn't see the rapey uncle coming that was one thing about the second film as soon as I saw him I thought I bet he's <laughs> going to end up a fiddler and right enough it got so ridiculous and it was yeah, every yeah. kind of stereotype as well where the dad dies off early as well mm. and then she stuck with him and I thought oh I, I could have written that you know I would have written it from for free you know because <laughs> I would have felt bad about writing something like that I, I actually sent that script in on the back of a cornflake packet well drunk. <laughs> <laughs> well, while, while I was eight, but the Royal Mail takes a while to get to America, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, you're right. It was really bad script writing, really bad. Um, it was it was every possible uh, kind of cliche, but cliche in a bad way. Um, and, and considering how he'd done so well. In the first and up to that point in the second he didn't need it he didn't need to go there he had everything lined up the girl didn't even need that past she could have just been a, a kind of a different sort of person you know because she already established her as an outsider socially she could have just been a sort of introverted thinker so she didn't think the same as the others and or they could have just had her with the hunting experience so you think yeah a, a girl who'd experienced hunting would be used to a certain amount of violence using weapons not as intimidated by blood or it's things like that so they had all the reasons there for her behavior they didn't need to add in the rapey uncle 
which was then used terribly mm. in the third where suddenly she was this Stockholm Syndrome that's right or, or they could have even had some kind of, just a better script of you know of having had prior sexual abuse or something you know they could have had that if it had just been better if it had been done better um, mm. but, but, it, but it was just too I'm not going to say easy pleasing because there's nothing pleasing about it but it, you know it, it just could have had a bit more depth to it it just seemed so superficial and cursory it's obviously because when you're running for you know you're running short of time for a, a traumatic experience it's an easy one to fit in uncle touched her you can tell that in two minutes then go on with the story hmm. it's the same with the cliche in so many films and tv series where if a man and woman meet over you know oh the end of the world's happening and here's the scientist guaranteed one of them's going to be divorced from the other because it gives the two characters an easy background introduction you can skip through all the hello my name is and getting to know each other and just get on with the story but it's such a cliche now we've all seen it you know <laughs> they should be learning from the other scripts to write something better not copying them yeah yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you another thing that really grated me in glass as well was this where uh, one thing would happen and then it would go back and show you how it was done like when uh, Samuel L. Jackson escaped for example and they had to go back to oh, show to show you how it was done and, it was and, and the same concrete. at the end with you know yeah, with yeah. What, what he did to the cameras and you know with the cameras and everything and had to go back and do that that is bad storytelling if you've got to do that you have got to seriously look at your script again and say well, that's shit. If I've got to do that in the story, <laughs> that is a shit script. It was no Kaiser yeah. Soce moment. And, and even I thought the way yeah. Glass came out, it was actually quite confusing because it took me a couple of seconds to realise that's what it was trying to do because it looked like he was wandering off to interfere with the machine <laughs> the way he cut it. Yeah, that's that's right. I, I got uh, I was the same as you. I, I was confused for the first couple of minutes. I, I went thought, back and had to watch it again. I thought, all right, so that's what's going on. <laughs> yeah. And, and so it became even more confusing instead of it clearing something up mm. um, which is what he was meant to be doing you know he was meant to be going back to clear up um, the complete bollocks of a script that he's you know he'd written in the first place where people yeah. went well well you know how did all that come about you should have just not said anything just let it play in your mind how did he do it that would have been so much more effective yeah it would also made Mr. Glass more impressive. You know, if they'd just done something, you're like, how did he manage to do that? You know, how did he, you know, do th it? would have been fine because he's meant to be the super villain. You know, the, the super villain doesn't need to explain everything to the audience. Yeah. Or, or, or given a hint later on. You know, mm. just, just hint at something. Whereby like they could have just had a, a, a camera pan by something, you see an element out the laser or something, and that's it. That's right, yeah. And, or you could have shown a panned over the laser and maybe a wire's cut or something's done to it and the audience could have worked it out. That's yeah. right, yeah. Just just show a little shot or something like that, you know, just give a little hint. So that, you know, something for the smarter end of the audience to do. And, do you know what? And they, I, I will, they, you know, they will come out of the cinemas and they say, ah, did you see that? Ah, do you, you know, because uh, mm. you know, they, they'll be discussing it in a group and they'll, you know, and some will go, well, I didn't get why the, the laser had no effect on you. Ah, you missed that, didn't you? You know, the the, the clever one will go and, and you know, because he'll want to inform the others <laughs> that, that, that he saw it and that he got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the others will feel happier. At, oh, they'll, you know, they'll get something out of it because, you know, they'll be learning about this film later on. People will like that. And it gives them a reason to watch it again. Yeah. It creates for discussions like these. Hmm. Did you notice also the rather weird gay guard moment? Where did you, did you <laughs> notice that one? No, no, where the, no he's giving diet tips and, where, stuff and drink more water. I well, that but it was that guy that you know he uh, earlier on in the film before that point he goes in and um, the beast character or well one of the characters he portrays himself as I don't know which one because he's, he's you know he's being tricky and we know that the tricky ones can pretend to be the other characters as well but he's on the, the ground uh, lying on his front with his legs up swinging them about like a, trying to act like a kind of coy girl 
and he's teasing in this guard who then walks in front of the strobes. You know, and that's obviously the trick. You know, he's blocking the strobe light so he can rush him. But he was doing it mm. in this very obvious, flirty way. And I thought, if that guard was straight, he, he would have just said, no, go away. <laughs> you know, he wouldn't have gone anywhere near him because there's even the tape, as you see on the ground. And he knows he's in an asylum for incredibly dangerous criminal people. So he wouldn't go near this person unless something had overridden it, which you can only assume was some sort of gay lust. Because why yeah. else is a guy mm. flirting on the ground saying, oh, come here, you know? In this very obviously flamboyant way with the legs flapping about and Eddie's hands up on his chin and stuff, you know? You know, leaning his, his uh, chin in his hands. Yeah, he was seducing them. It was kind of creepy, but yeah. that's that's what these but it could only work do, isn't the, it? Yeah, and it could only work if the guard was that way inclined. If he was a straight man, he'd never have fallen for that. But but even, mm. even so, you know, to do that, if you were a guard in a in an asylum for the criminally insane why would you do that well you know it, it seemed Especially completely... that guy famous for being the beast famous in that film yeah there's a massive flaw as well though with that strobe light fucking thing i mean what if the, the strobe light goes off and it changes like the the little boy that he plays and it transforms him instantly into the beast you yeah. never thought of that fucking safety precaution did they True. Yeah, it's true. Or he could have gone from the beast to Dennis, both of which could kill somebody. Yeah, yeah. Or he could have picked up the blanket, ran towards the strobes with the blanket on his head and smashed them all up. He never thought of that, did he? I know, I know. Because he had a you... pillow. He could have just stuck the pillow in front of his face, walked up, walked behind the strobes and smashed them because he could do that in the room. Walked right up to the door, smashed the strobes, take the pillow off his head and he's invincible now. Yep. <laughs> yep. Imagine your boss told you to do that. You're going to go into that criminally insane mental cases cell. There's mm. going to be nothing there to defend you from them except for some tape and some lights in the wall. Yeah. Now, I mean, yeah. Now the thing is, James, that you've just mentioned all these flaws just now off the top of your head. Yeah. How the hell did they miss all these? Yeah, that's that's the question. Especially when you think how long a film takes to write and make. Yeah, you you, you can't miss it. No. Well, and yeah. and, but, and this is the sort of st strange thing about uh, M Night Shyamalan now that he seems to miss all these flaws. He's so obsessed with get, cobbling together these surprise endings and so on that he misses the he misses out the fundamentals of the the flaws in logic of his films and the other thing as well is they made the whole uh, weakness for Bruce's character ridiculous because in the first one it wasn't that he w it was like crypt kryptonite to him where, you know poison bread and water because he always had a shower and a bath now and then yeah. it's just that he was normal you know if you threw him in a pool with a pool cover on it yeah if you get wrapped in plastic and thrown in water you know, you're in danger of drowning that was all it showed uh, both in his childhood memory and when the villain in the house threw him out, it was just the fact that there was a pool cover there. Mm. But yet now in the, th the third film, they show it as if suddenly the touch of water is like the aliens from that rotten bloody film. Yeah. And it just so happened there's a They just shoved him in a puddle. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they're, they're, trying to shove, they're trying to shove him in a puddle and suddenly <laughs> he couldn't even puddle. stand up. <laughs> yeah, he couldn't even stand up. It was literally yeah. a puddle, yet we saw him minutes before dunked into a tank of water, completely submerged, and he punched his way out. Yeah, but he can't get some guy's hand off the back of his neck. One hand? The guy was even just doing it with one hand, like he yeah. was just a wee boy, and this is the super strong guy. And if he's ah, unbreakable, he's not ah, shot, is he? But what if that guy, that, secu that security guy, turns up in the next film? Oh, that I'll be watching. <laughs> <Paul would be money. laughs> I'll be walking out the film at that point, ticket in hand, looking for a refund. Yeah, you're right. In this this film, I'll tell you the other thing about this film as as well that really sort of put me off. It, it just seemed like a series. It didn't seem like a film at all. It My seemed, next though. It seemed like some kind of series like ER or something like that. Yeah. Like like things like, oh, what was that one? Like I, I know what you mean. Some of these ones where you've got, like, that one Jessica Alba was in. Do you remember that one at all? No? Uh, 
Um, I can't think of it. Oh. Uh, I think it was James Cameron or something was involved in it. One of the big name directors was involved in it originally. Yeah. But you know how you get these superhero type series. It was I right enough. It was like that. It was like an episode where you got this. Aha! There's a secret organization, and that'd be like episode two in the new season or whatever. And you know oh, that yeah. this season is going to all be about battling the secret organization or finding out about them. You know. Yeah. It, it really was like that. But you can't do that in a film because that just leaves you feeling cheated. Well, oh, right. I know who the bad guys are going to be in the next movie. Well, because they drowned everyone else or killed them, so there's only one left. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, if that's unless, of course, they're they're dead or not. I mean, Bruce Willis is unbreakable, so no, he's dead. Is that... He's dead, isn't he? He, he? he was told. We were told he's dead at the end, weren't we? But is it like matter of fact? Because he like faked it, disappeared. I mean, if he's unbreakable, he's not going to be able to get drowned in a puddle. I mean, he can jump through a steel door. They seem I mean, to. he's not going to get... Sh- they seem to. They seem to kill him uh, in that puddle. But um, that, 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 that's what it was left as, anyway. Maybe in the fourth, yeah. they wake up in the shower and it turns out water gives him nightmares. That whole third film never happened. Yeah. Or like, uh, there's a oh, you, you, you're going for the Dallas uh, sequel, are you? That's it. It always <laughs> works. <Yeah. laughs> Bobby Ewing, uh, you know, suddenly appears in the shower. Hey, hi, uh, did you have a good night's sleep? <laughs> well, no, this is written by the same guy who kills off aliens with glasses of the water. So he could reveal something really stupid at the start of when is his next movie. And that's the big reveal. It's at the start of the movie. If he just Bruce totally Wilson, third, if he totally undid the third film, I'd forgive him for it. If he made a film as good as the first or second and just wiped out the third film, fine you know whatever excuses needs to do <laughs> i'm fine with yeah i i just don't think we've seen the end of them i think honestly they're going to bring him back in the next movie even for the money if this one's a success hmm. yeah because the you, know there's, gonna, you know there's going to be one more it's set it up for another one i can just tell more than years at the movie in a year's time we will be talking about the next movie i guarantee it <laughs> 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 it's quite possible. I wouldn't bet against you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not going to bet against you either. <laughs> Damn. Um, I, I think we ought to come on to the very last reveal, uh, the, the the very end of the film of Glass, um, because again, there are extreme flaws with that. The... What one specifically? Because there, there's a there's a few reveals in this movie. Well, I'm, I'm mm. talking about the very last one where everyone's got the um, footage on their mobile. Oh yeah, yeah, everything. okay. Oh yeah, yeah. And that's meant to have an awakening of yeah. potential powers. That's that's it's... right. That everyone knows that there's real superheroes and so on. Well, the, the amount of bullshit you get on YouTube and so on. Um, oh yeah. The the amount of things with special effects, even by fan fiction, why would anyone believe it? They're not going to just I stop and, and go, oh, wow. I'm There's quite videos. sure if I went on YouTube right now and searched for Man Flips Car, I'd probably find a couple of dozen. Hmm. Then again, on the sinister side, there's videos online of um, massive gangs of people raping women in Germany, all over the world, beheading videos, it doesn't change anybody's opinion. You know, maybe a few, a few waking up and going, oh yeah, okay. Most kind of just switch it off and forget they ever seen it again. It's almost like the film makes out that if we're told there's superheroes out there, it's going to have this one big awakening for everybody and we're all going to get along. But then you have some genuinely horrible videos on the internet which have never changed opinion and never changed public opinion towards something. Well, it's down to just telling somebody a fact of anything isn't enough to change them. Which, yeah. ironically, was exactly what they explained in the first film because they told him the fact of his existence in the first one. But, but until he actually believed himself and went all the way, he never lived up to it. He was still just an ordinary guy with some odd abilities. Yeah, mm. yeah. So he's actually subverting his own <laughs> film. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. Yeah. I just got that feeling at the end of it that this, the whole thing, sharing a, a video publicly online is going to bring us together into some utopia if only we believe in ourselves. And, and I'm just like, come on. 
it was like it was written by somebody else trying to continue a series by him rather than you know it doesn't feel like it's authentic hmm plus you think that the great genius could have worked out a way of showing footage of somebody doing something spectacular that doesn't involve everyone getting killed you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> was that the only way of doing it he thought no no we've all got to get killed to show anything at all that's 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 the single solution it sounds it's rubbish martyrs martyrs for us some strange cause which doesn't match up with a super villain's mentality anyway yeah they want to live and see the chaos that they've created and live to see what they're doing um, but obviously he couldn't do that if he's just falling out of his wheelchair and broken every bone in his body but uh Mm. No, you would have thought you'd have a plan against that. I mean, you well, planned course, everything else out. No, like a seatbelt in, seat <laughs> in his wheelchair would have fucking helped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you would think somebody that's that fragile. <laughs> yeah. But, but also the, the, the added reveal where uh, the Beast or the Horde characters, his dad was killed on the train at the same time as Bruce's he's like, oh you didn't need to add that either this is just aha look it's all interconnected right at the end as well where it means nothing getting that revealed it didn't mean anything it just no, was an excuse right. for the beast it was just an excuse for the beast to hit Mr Glass but the trouble is he didn't even need the beast to defeat Mr Glass uh, physically that was the whole point of him a wee girl could have killed him yeah yeah but it was totally yeah. unnecessary it was yet another cheap moment in that whole film yeah um and and the thing is that there were that as i mentioned before glass and mr glass as samuel l jackson's character is having to narrate all the way through the bloody film uh to the audience what's going on and and how this relates to comic books and 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 that for me was that that spoiled the film entirely it it just it it, it I couldn't get engrossed in the film because of this. Mm. This the psychologist character, although it was uh, had the, the terrible twist of ah, it's a secret society. Even that, the way it was played out was cliche all along. Where you've got this obsessed psychiatrist, you know, the obsessed psychiatrist about the uh, whatever villain they're meant to be looking after. I mean, that's been done over and over again. Yeah, that's right. You know, and then, of course, you even had the line to the son, tell me about your mother, <laughs> which you can't think of a more cliche line for a, any kind of psychiatrist to come out with in a film. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, was, it was such bad writing. And, and the, camera, uh, the camera work as well was poor. Uh, you know, I mean, in, in the first, if we, yeah, generic, exact, that's the exact word um, that, uh, that we need here, generic. There was nothing special about it. There was, like in the first film, when when you had Mr. Glass falling down those stairs, and and you didn't see him fall down the stairs, you just saw that stylized view of his cane shattering, and, mm. and that that to me was was far better than anything, you, you know, in uh, in this this entire film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it was such a wonderful. Um, a wonderful allusion to what was happening. The cane became a symbol of Mr. And Glass. you really, you could really like cringe because you could imagine it, you know. So it got, got got the point home. Yeah, it did. Absolutely right. And and as I say, the the symbolism used there, where the cane actually became Mr. Glass, you know that that he he became such a symbol of of his disability that it became him, uh, and uh, and and his injury. As he was falling down the stairs, and but but that that sort of when when he was chasing the guy to see if he had a gun or, or not, uh, and and that meant more to him than than, than actually avoiding the accident that could have easily be, have been avoided, that he had to yeah. know. Mm. And even uh, lying there crippled, he was smiling, just getting that one glimpse. Yeah. And, and it showed the sort of obsessive kind of character that he was at the same time. You see that, that it was so wonderfully crafted. All that was so wonderfully crafted. And, and, and you it's had none of that. It, in this it's film. clever because it explains why he's the villain as well. You know, they're, they're dropping you real hints that he's a villain because he is absolutely obsessed. It all, you know, he'll even cripple his body and laugh about it if he gets what he wants. That kind of person would kill, you know, you could imagine. 
Yeah, that's right. That's right. That there so things... it's not cheap to, to, to make him turn out to be a villain at the end. Exactly. Exactly. And you have the... Rather than, look at my tattoo, by the way, you're all getting killed now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's like right. Like the third film. Yeah. I've got a clover tattoo. No one will notice all these thousands of people over thousands of years who all have a clover tattoo on their thumb. Couldn't possibly notice that. So, so, so it's the Irish then, is it? Yeah. <laughs> you, know, cause you know what would really be there. Yeah, it, it, it was all just really sort of cobbled together where it was the last film. There was... Um, I'll, I'll uh, sort of bring things to a close and talk about uh, one thing which is um, which I think is an extreme positive about the films in general and that is the celebration of masculinity because in Hollywood now it is so often deconstructed and and here we have stories that really are a celebration of traditional masculinity yeah absolutely like I said before um, I would like to think that I was in a position like um, Bruce Willis's character in the first one I could go out and, and you know do damage to bad people and we all want to do that deep down but now now we're talking, hey, you can't do that. We have to talk to them first. We, or Jordan Peterson would say, well, we have to look at the reasons as to why these rapists are raping people and some convoluted excuse like that. When people like me just think, bring it back to the olden times. When there's nothing wrong with thinking like that because I'm a man and that's what men think. And it was good because you saw the heroic masculine side, but you also saw the the kind of quiet masculine side of everyday life, family life, work life. Yeah. You know, it was solid all the way with that. that that's right. Um, he had a paternalism, uh, did Bruce Willis's character, in all manners. So he, he had that heroic side uh, and, and the, the family man side. Often the two, of course, coming into tension because he was having to negate the heroic side of himself. Uh, to look after his family and particularly to, to look after his, his wife. You get that scene in the beginning where on the train he's, he, you know, he's chatting to that woman you know, who he finds attractive and he takes his wedding ring off and you see that sort of vulnerability that there's something not quite right there at home. And of yeah. course you, mm -hmm. you, you see that he's, he's having to deny such a, a big part of himself um, to keep on with this, uh, you know, this neurotic woman and everything. Mm. And even the, the way he, he lies about his injury was a, a small sacrifice just so he could have a family and settle down because he didn't want to be what he could have been was a sort of living up celebrity, living like a, a big boy, basically. He decided that what was more important was a family. Yeah. Yeah, that's... Is that not what really happened to him as well? In the movie, I think they say he's like a football injury that stopped him from being able to be a footballer. Did he not have something like that in real life? Like a an injury that stopped him playing a sport? Was he not like a, a footballer, a baseball player or something like that? In a, an injury Bruce, stopped... the actor? Yeah, yeah, I'm sure I read that he had a shoulder injury or something like that from, from some sport and it kind of stopped him being able to do it and that's all he wanted to really do. So he's kind of like a, a film about Bruce Willis in a way uh, I think you're right there Neil uh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that uh, he um, he has that um, that because he's got a scar on his shoulder yeah that backstory to to him yeah I'm, 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 yeah I'm, sh I'm sure I've heard something about that so uh, who better to play him than Bruce Willis yeah, yeah. why not um, use that also apparently it was a it was a security guard so he, he? yeah so he's not a pretend tough guy like did you think he genuinely is a tough guy um well but I'm, I'm just sort of going for you know the similarities between bruce willis the actor and the guy he plays in the film here because oh, that's right because yeah he's a security guard right yeah mm. so that's, that's quite interesting as well uh, i wonder oh. how much was that was written for him or was that just a happy accident or <laughs> did they have him in mind when yeah. they wrote it all I, th I think that uh, M. Night Shyamalan had Bruce Willis in mind. Uh, certainly, of course, because he'd worked with him in The Sixth Sense. Mm. So, so you'd be sure he'd probably be able to get him having that relationship. Yeah. 
yeah. Um, is there anything you would like to add, gentlemen, uh, at the end here? No, I mean, they're, they're, they're good films. Like, watch, you give them a good watch if you haven't seen them before, even though we've ruined them for you because we've given away every single reveal in every single <laughs> film. Well, but there's one. Try and enjoy it best you can. There was one other thing I noticed in the, the second one where you have the Beast character, especially it's the Beast's uh, ca- uh, personality it comes from, where he's obsessed with the idea of suffering being a virtue and suffering being purity and so on. But co- that has come from the most explicitly evil character in the whole series, which I thought was interesting, considering the modern victim mentality being celebrated. Where you know you're looking to be a victim to virtue signal. Mm. Mm. Yeah. So it's, it's sort of inverting the modern morality back to a more traditional one, where no, it's not a great thing for a little girl to suffer and have anything. That, you know, it's not a great thing to have this checklist of things that have happened to you. You know, it shouldn't. You shouldn't have anything like that in an ideal world. Yeah. No. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, it's. Um these films are really they they contradict a lot of the hollywood narratives and um in particular i think you know i think that the first film uh, is a great uh, you know I, I like to watch it every so often i like to go back to it because it's um i think it's a, a truly great film and um and certainly uh, as i've said goes against a lot of the hollywood garbage uh, the sort of SJW ideas that are pumped out now and so you know I, I really recommend it to traditionalists like us mm. it was like a Batman film that should have been <laughs> how it should have been made it should have been made by him in that when he had that uh, muse behind him that spirit behind him it would, he would have made a great Batman film he would yeah he, he would <laughs> actually yeah that's very true because Bruce Wayne of course is just a normal guy Mm. Uh, admittedly a very rich normal guy but you know he has no special powers or anything and the villains he's meant to meet are again mostly all sort of normal guys that are just criminals or criminally insane and of course when you watch Split what a great villain that would have been in a Batman film as well yeah absolutely um, so um, I'll um, I'll leave it on that note then and um, I'll say thank you to uh, James and Neil Thank you. Goodbye. And I'll, Thank you. Yeah, and I'll just offer a last bit of thanks to Hope Not Hate, who have kindly advertised this channel in their state of hate this year. Thank you very much. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Bye for now. We're going to be famous. Bye-bye. <laughs>